welcome to Transformative Principle, where I help you stop putting out fires and start leading. I am your host, Jethro Jones. You can follow me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. I mentioned in episode 462 that I'm doing a new training program called How to Be a Transformative Principal. It's for those who are in their first three years of being a principal or assistant principals or aspiring principals who want to level up their game right now. Join me at jethrojones.com slash how the number two B. How to B. We'll see you there. That's jethrojones.com slash how to B. Welcome to Transformative Principle. I am very excited to have Becca Silver on the program today. Becca is a coach who helps school administration in the leadership and communication skills needed to close the adult knowledge gap. Once she did that, she started to see school-wide culture shifts, relationships strengthening, and higher teacher satisfaction and resilience. Her goal is to empower instructional coaches to impact educators in a way that increases their resilience, efficacy, and satisfaction. Becca, welcome to Transformative Principle. Thank you. I'm excited to talk with you today, and thanks for taking the time to be here. So let's talk first about this huge teacher shortage and teacher burnout situation that's happening. Surely few infused by the challenges of the pandemic, but not just that. So why are teachers burning out now beyond just the pandemic? Yeah, there's, there's lots of reasons. Um, one of the things as I uh, am working with schools is we're seeing a lot of new. Uh, last year was a lot of new uh, with the pandemic abruptly uh, going uh, virtual practically overnight and uh, teachers having to learn a lot of new uh, almost two years ago. And then last year, there was still a lot of new. And then we have this new term that we throw around uh, around a lot, um, uh, learning loss, student learning loss. Yeah, I hate and that term. I know, I do too. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> and um, to make up for this learning loss, uh, districts have bought all these new programs, right? And uh, teachers, once again, are having to learn more new and they're exhausted, and uh, they have not been taken care of well. And, and a lot of the what we're seeing in schools is just a lot of trainings. The teachers are showing up every day. They're dealing with whatever thoughts they have about COVID and their physical safety uh, rules that their district has made about COVID. And then and on top of it, new curriculum um, and all of these kind of meetings and they're, they're, they don't have the, I'm hearing stories about, they don't, they're taking all this work home and they're just not able to even take a breath and enjoy the profession that they went into. Yeah. And that, that is a real issue for sure. And I'll get on my soapbox a little bit about learning loss. And the real challenge with it is that one, it negates anything that the kids may have learned that isn't measured in school over the course of the pandemic, which is wrong. First of all, mm -hmm. second of all, when a student really learns something, they don't lose that learning. They just, it just stays there. And some things kids forget, which means they haven't really learned them first of all. So we're lying from the word go on that. And then second, they, they may have some issues where they have forgotten how to do certain things or how to do procedures or something in the classroom as it relates to math or reading even or other subjects. And that's, that's all fine, but they didn't really learn that in the first place. Anyway, real learning is like riding a bike. You don't forget how to do it because you've been away from it for a while. You may need a refresher. You may need to remember some things, but you can get back on the bike and go again most of the time. But then the other part of it that you're really talking about is this idea of talking about learning loss as a, as an issue makes it so that teachers are having to do so much more work to bring that bring those kids back to where they quote unquote should be. So how, what's your perspective on that last part about the pressure on teachers that is so much greater than it was before? 
Well, you know, the, the interesting thing is there are supports in schools for teachers, placed in schools for teachers, right? And, and people outside the education system don't really know this role exists, but inside schools, we know coaches exist, right? Mm-hmm. So they're called lots of things, facilitators or teacher leaders or mm-hmm. lead teachers, right? And whatever it's called, it's a person whose role is uh, to support teachers, and uh, many times, and I, and I, I really, you know, they, they're here, they're trying to help you know, bridge, you know, kind of usher the teachers into this school year and support them. And many times they have limited skills to do that. Mm-hmm. So what we're seeing a lot is just extra training. Yeah. So the skills are, are limited, but they've been classroom teachers. So they, mm-hmm. they have some skills. But the skills are different for adults than they are for kids. And the skills are different for coaching versus teaching. So can you talk a little bit about those two things? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, so like you said, many times coaches are, are elevated from being excellent classroom teachers to being a coach, right? And they're hired as this new position and given very little to no training on adult learning theory, right? On like, how do you influence adults? So they were elevated to this new position and they were essentially elevated out of their skill set. They were excellent with, with teaching children and now they're working with adults. And that concept is called the Peter Principle, named after Peter Drucker. Um, and it happens in organizations all the time and it happens in schools, right? We are elevating people out of their skill set and not acknowledging that that's happening. So it's not a problem that they've been elevated to now help other teachers and influence them. We just need to give them the supports on how to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this is an issue where it- – teachers being elevated out of their position is a real thing. It happens when they become principals also sometimes, and that requires a completely different skill set. Although there many things are shared between those skill sets, but it definitely requires a different way of approaching the work. And, and you have to recognize that and know that people are going to need additional support and they don't always get that additional support because we have other ideas of what they may or may not need. And Mm -hmm. that makes it more challenging also. So how do we know what skills are good for coaches versus skilled teachers? Oh, some, are you talking about kind of what different skills are needed? Communication skills Mm -hmm. are foundational. And it's, it's, it's so interesting because it's, that's not one of the things that's talked about. I, when I'm, I'm, I'm in some coaches chat and a lot of times they talk about pro, what program to use. They're, they're constantly talking about these programs and tiering and, and structures. And it's, how do you relate to someone else's humanity, you know, and, and bringing and understanding that other adults are people, right? And there is a shared humanity that we all are operating under. For example, we all have some version of not being good enough. We all do. No one escapes that, right? And to understand that, right? And that influences our beliefs and the narratives we have about ourselves influences our behavior, Yeah. Right. And so really to think about coaching as I am working with full fledged adults that have beliefs and mindsets that that are that foundational that cause these behaviors. I want to actually get trained in communication, both speaking and listening to hear and see what what's someone's mindset. Why? are these behaviors happening and not, and it's just so often, I like to say when we, when I'm looking for like the source of a teacher's um, actions, I look for, are they missing um, knowledge, skills, or mindsets? And so often in schools, most often the knowledge, not it's just, they just must need more knowledge. Schools just think, Oh, we need to train them better, send them to another training. And, and more often than not, that's not the case. Yeah. And this is a really interesting perspective that you bring up that our default is to say, well, they must need more knowledge. And really it's often not that they have all the knowledge that they need, but it's their skills and their mindsets. And this, I find with my coaching of principals all the time that they, they were prepared very well 
in the knowledge they would need to be a principal, but they were not prepared well in the skills and the mindsets. And Mm -hmm. that's what my next book is all about. The interviews that I've done over the 460 plus episodes of this podcast is, and finding out those mindsets and skills that principals need to be able to be successful because they don't teach you that in grad school. And that is exactly why I started this podcast was to find those things that I needed to get better. And I learned a lot through interviewing people. I learned a lot through experience and yet still our professional programs prepare us with knowledge. And that is their response also. And unfortunately that's what we do with kids too. And we can get into the kid discussion in a little bit, but I'm sure longtime listeners know exactly how I feel about that. So (laughs) John Cat Educational supports high quality teaching and learning by providing publications that are research based, practical, and focused on the key topics proven essential in today's and tomorrow's schools. The latest John Cat publications include a book whose bold, transformative ideas amaze and infuriate people around the world, according to one reviewer, a title from Global Leaders in Curriculum Planning, Practice, and Retrieval, one book that says stop talking and start doing with regard to teacher well being, and much more. These books used by educators of all roles across North America and worldwide amplify fresh, engaging voices with practical strategies to create transformative change. Learn more in our show notes at jethrojones.com slash podcast. So let's talk about what some things are that we can do to help people learn the skills and mindsets that they need. Yeah, I really, I I firmly believe that coaches need to learn to listen. Mm -hmm. I think like really high level listening skills, not just shut up and listen, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but like actually build that skill. So um, there's different ways we can listen. Right. And I have these kind of uh, humorous titles for different kinds of listeners. One of them I call the patient waiter, which is like, I'm patiently waiting for you to stop talking. (laughs) That's not listening. Then there's the advice monster. So I'm just going to, as you're talking, I'm thinking about all the advice I'm going to give you. Um, And then I I have in quotes, active listening. That's not really active listening. People think they're actively listening, but they're not listening to other, to, to what, other people are actually saying they're listening to their own inner dialogue about it. And so what's magical about developing the skill of listening is you can hear things. You can actually hear what someone's communicating and then you can hear between their words, hear what's important to them. You can hear um, uh, what, what they're committed to, like why the reasoning behind what they're doing. They don't have to say that you can start to hear it. And when people feel heard, that's when trust is built and relationships are built. Yeah, that's fantastic. So give me an example of how to listen um, effectively and what that would look like when you know that it's happening as opposed to, you know, you know like <laughs> you're, you're giving your inner dialogue on, you're listening to your inner dialogue on what your interpretation of what they're saying is. So give yeah. us a good example of, of how we can do that. Listen appropriately. Yeah. So uh, one of my favorite ways of listening is called reflective listening and you can Google it. And reflective listening is you're basically reflecting back what someone is saying to you. So someone is speaking to you and you, it, it really, it takes effort because we don't have the muscle for this. We're not used to this, but when, when they, when they've shared what they need to share, you say, what I heard you say was, and you actually repeat back what they said. And wh- how I know it's effective in my, in my experience of all these years doing it, one of two things happens, or sometimes both of these things happen. One is um, they have some version of yes. And yeah. And, and they keep going. Uh, because many times we, we don't, most of the time we don't actually feel heard. So the moment it's like a little taste of it, right? We want to keep going. We're like, Ooh, <laughs> they actually are hearing me. And the other thing is something physical happens. You get more eye contact, shoulders relax. 
there's something, sometimes people cry. Mm -hmm. There's something physical happens and it's beautiful. I can totally tell if someone feels heard. I like that. So what you're saying is that in order (laughs) to listen well, we need to repeat back what they said, which is there's two things that happen. One, there's a yes and, and two, there's a physical response that we can actually see happening. And when we do that, then people engage more and are more anxious and willing to share with us what's really going on. Yep. That's exactly it. No one's ever reflectively listened to me about reflective listening. I am so impressed. <laughs> I feel like we went into this weird, like uh, time warp thing that was, ugh, it was, it was awesome. So thank you for, for indulging me there. So I think that that reflective listening piece is really important and it is not easy to reflectively listen all the time. It takes energy. And so how do you manage to do that when you're pulled in a hundred different directions? It takes time and energy. So what's your advice for someone who wants to do that more often and knows how to do it, but how do they improve their skills so they actually do it more often? Uh, I would say practice as often as you can practice at home, practice with your kids, practice with everyone uh, so that the muscle, it really is a muscle. So the muscle is built um, to do it much more naturally uh, because it's, it's not, we listen, we are constantly hearing words coming at us, right? It's not going to change the amount that people are talking to us per se. It's how we listen. I like to say that my training, when I train coaches, I don't put things on their plate. I'm not giving them additional things to do. I'm changing what they are already doing, how they're doing it. So that's all it is. You're changing how you're listening. Well, this, that is a small thing that you just kind of threw out there. Like it's, it's what you do. Everybody knows, but that's really (laughs) important because changing how you're doing something often can lead to dramatic results. Dramatic. And especially as a coach, listening to what people are saying. So when I was a district level coach, I had schools that I would go and work with. And um, there was one school where I was trying to help these teachers do co-teaching, which is a great strategy for supporting kids with special needs and English language learners as well. And these, these two teachers kept saying how much they disliked working with each other. And because I wasn't actually listening, I never saw that that was the real issue. And had I been paying attention to the things between, I could have helped them and we could have just abolished the program right then and there, because what's the point of forcing it when we know that it's not going to work? Or I could have done some coaching to support them through that relationship building phase. And it wasn't until several years later when I worked with Ann Benninghoff about and had her come to my school and work with teachers and co-teaching. And she said right from the word go, this is about the relationship between you two as teachers. If you don't have a good relationship, this is never going to work. So if you are paired up with someone that you're not going to work well with, you might as well stop right now because it's not worth it. And I was like, man, that is brilliant because had I paid attention all those years ago, I would have known that those two teachers, it was never going to work out. And sure enough, it didn't end up working out. And as soon as the support me, the coach left, then it was dead in the water and they pretty much just went back to what they were doing before. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And, and something that reflective listening, I've the coaches that I've trained in this, they roll during the pandemic, they were coming back and reporting back, you know, resistant to teachers that wouldn't even talk to them were showing up at their door. Administration was noticing the coaches that the teachers were so much more, willing to get coaching that you, you're they're seeing total shifts in their relationships with with teachers right and it's interesting the the i i like to call them reluctant teachers right there or there's a, re, a reluctance to building a relationship for lots of different reasons mm-hmm. and i think reflective listening i always say if you have a teacher that's not willing to a coach if you have a teacher that's not willing to build a relationship with you reflective listen first have them yeah. feel heard and understood Yeah, that's such good advice. And I think that's a good, a good way to just approach anyone that you're not working well with, because Mm -hmm. it, it shows that you are more concerned about what's going on with them than you are about them doing what you're trying to get done. And I've made that mistake so many times of thinking that I knew what was right and people should just do it rather Mm -hmm. than just saying, 
what what's on your mind with this? You know, and the few times where I was smart enough to reflectively listen, I saw tremendous growth, tremendous willingness to do what needed to be done, but real hesitation and concerns about how it was being implemented or what we were doing. And you just can't overlook that and think that that doesn't matter. You have to address those concerns and, and help people see that they're not alone. So my last question is what is one thing that a principal can do this week to be a transformative leader like you, Becca? Oh, um, I, I would, I would say, listen, listen to, listen to your people and, and hear, hear what they need. Listen for what they need, not what you think they need. Right. And actually be willing to give up your assumptions about what other people are going to say. Um, but really listen for what other people need to feel supported. Not what, again, not what you think the support should look like, but listening for what they need to feel supported. Yeah. So Becca, could you distill that down a little bit more specifically? So who should a principal go talk to? Who should they seek out and practice reflexive listening with? I think they should seek out their coaches, first of all, and, and uh, APs, anyone in their admin team, any adult in the building that supports teachers, them first, right? It starts from leadership down and really have that culture. I'm really a culture nut. Like we're not doing this one-time activity. It's not kumbaya feel good. We are actually creating, we're normalizing behaving this way. Mm -hmm. So that's who I would say do it first with, and then have that distilled down to those leaders in the building doing that with teachers, right? Now you have a team of people doing it and not just one. Yeah, very good. Well, Becca, this was a wonderful conversation. If people would like to follow you on Twitter, then it is Becca Silver underscore EDU, correct? Mm -hmm. And your website is thewholeeducator.com. And I definitely want uh, to encourage people to check you out and see what you're doing, connect with you on Twitter and learn more from you. Becca, thank you so much for being part of Transformative Principle today. Thank you for having me.